that you see exactly. um, to, exactly. to this problem. Is it is it around educating people and just changing the education system or educating people around the right industries or? or well, it's first highlighting what will be the jobs of the future. And yes, you know, data analytics is, you know, obviously a big area. Listen, healthcare is the biggest industry in this country. Healthcare jobs are going to grow. They're going to change dramatically, but they're going to grow very dramatically. A lot of it, you know, the aging of the population, you know, just being an example of it. Um, I believe the not-for-profit world will be a big growth area, unfortunately. A uh, big growth area from uh, an employment uh, standpoint. Uh, you know, cybersecurity uh, jobs uh, are going to grow tremendously. So what we, our team at Working Nation, and we've got an incredible team of uh, really experts, um, our first job is really searching out where those jobs will be and really engaging with all kinds of think tanks and other really very knowledgeable uh, uh, organizations, people, uh, and then figuring out where are the solutions? Mm -hmm. And we are very focused on the fact that solutions are local. Corporations, not-for-profits, academic entities, and local government. What they are doing in different, it's not to say federal tax policy and budget policy can't have influence, but the solutions themselves are really at the local level. So what our team has been doing, you know, and we've really been up, up and running with researchers and, and others for, uh, probably about four and a half years now, um, we uh, are searching for those solutions out there with the goal of then telling the story of those solutions mm. through the people who have gone through those uh, solution uh, type setups. You know, not having a job now in the United States is very different from not having a job in the United States 200 years ago when I mean, you literally might have starved to death or died of hypothermia or, or you know, pick, pick a reason. Um, I mean, it's, it, it reminds one of the Keynes remark that, you know, in the future we'll all work eight hours. And, you know, maybe driving an Uber for eight hours a week, you could have all the comforts that, that they had when Keynes was writing that. So I guess, you know, and this is, is part of the universal basic income idea that, well, we're making so much money now, we can just kind of give, give people money to, to deal with. So... I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm leading the witness here, but why is that not the approach you're taking to, to these problems? I am confronted frequently by the universal basic income concept. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm sitting and you know, having breakfast or lunch with someone, oh, well, 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 that's the solution. Um, my response uh, from day one is, one, I have no idea how you pay for it. But two, very importantly, it leaves out, I think, a very important piece of the equation, and that is the linkage between employment and purpose in life. Um, I started thinking about that probably about three, three and a half years ago when I started thinking about my own life. Mm -hmm. And putting aside dollars and cents, thought about all the different things I did and the opportunities to work with Mike Milken and Ted Turner and Danny Lewin, et cetera. That was pretty motivating. You know, mm -hmm. I probably would have done it even if I wasn't paid, but... Good, I got paid. And so then I started, and that actually started, I was up in Palo Alto at a think tank uh, up there that I was talking to about this. Someone said something that caused me to start thinking about my own life. So then I next went to, started talking, thinking about the assembly line worker. And to what extent is their employment an important piece of their purpose in life? And after talking to some people and all, I ultimately concluded they too. You know, they show up for work, they're working with friends, compatriots, they're producing something, they're bringing home income uh, to feed and educate the family. They're part of a community. And so I said, okay, you know, it's different than my, you know, my life, but I said, you know, I th really think there's a tie. And then what happened uh, sometime shortly after that, a woman shows up in my office who I know from uh, my past life, from my New World days, she shows up in my office with the movie rights to Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, um, a book that I was aware of but had never read. I had no interest in making a movie, but uh, it did cause me to read it. And I said, wow, this really ties in with, you know, my idea of, you know, the linkage of meaning in life and uh, purpose uh, and fulfillment. It really got me, you know, thinking quite a bit about it. 
Um, for those who aren't aware, that book is, I think, on the Library of Congress's 10 most influential books ever published in the United States. I am sure I'm the largest purchaser of it because as I go around on working nation meetings, like this week in New York, I probably promised at least uh, 10 <laughs> to people I met with this week. And for those who have not read it, sorry I can't send it to you, but you can go buy it <laughs> from Amazon or whoever else. Uh, but it's a fabulous quick read, and it's really an eye-opener. What then happened during the first quarter of 16, I turned on the TV show Morning Joe, and Steve Ratner, the investment and economics guy who's on the show frequently, first chart showed how life expectancy of white males had begun to decline for the first time in history. Mm. And then the second chart showed causes and showed a major spike up in addiction and suicide. And I said, okay, how does that tie in with what's going on? Uh, here and the pain that really does exist out there in society. And then Nicholas Eberstadt of the American Enterprise Institute during the second quarter of 16 heard about what I was doing. He had recently written a book, Men Without Work. And I met with him in Washington at one point when I was there and he had a statistic, something like 16% of the white working age males, and that's defined 25 to 54, are either unemployed, underemployed, or have withdrawn from the workforce. Well, that's very different than what people were talking about, going back to the point about the unemployment, unemployment rate. rate. And then, a couple months later, we all watched both the Donald Trump and the Bernie Sanders movements explode that summer. Mm -hmm. And to me, it was a no-brainer. I said, there are millions of people in this country that are in pain, either economic pain mm -hmm. or emotional pain, purpose in life pain, might be themselves, it might be other family members, other friends in the community, but there are millions of people in pain. And I really believe when we look at uh, out across uh, the political environment, what has gone on since then, very few talk about how, you know, blame a lot of the stuff on the political environment, but so few talk about what underlies the political environment. And I really believe, yeah, there are other things besides the stuff I'm focused on, but I do think the stuff I'm focused on is a pretty key part of what's driving the political environment. So looking down the road, I, I guess it's that, you know, we've, we've always had technological change, but that now it's happening faster and that's leading to more displacement, which is leading people to, to lose their purpose in life. And, and if you lo look out, you know, 20 or 30 or 50 years, if this trend continues, um, I, I guess to me that, you know, either we have to, people have to find uh, new work in, in the you know post agrarian period or you know whatever you want to call it, um, or we ha or people have to find other ways to you know to to find their purpose in life and to find meaning um, without work. Let me give you actually what I think is maybe the toughest piece of the entire equation. Mm -hmm. You know, I mentioned you know the way I usually talk about it is three motivations for me and for Working Nation. One was the slope of the curve. Two, as I addressed, this time it's about the heart of America and how the bottom 20% will become the bottom 30% and bottom 40% and 50%. The third one, and I think is the toughest one, is never before have we had to reskill and re-educate all the 48-year-olds. Hmm. And I'm using 48 generically to cover 30, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and that is a very tricky thing. Uh, you know, it's one thing to be able to educate, you know, young children uh, and, you know, up right through, you know, college and community college. Uh, also, the high, whole idea of instilling lifelong learning mentality in people. When I speak to big K through 12 educational groups, uh, I tell them, look, you don't need me to talk about STEM education. You hear enough about that. I'm not an educator, so I can't really offer you a lot, but the one thing I will offer you is I think the mo one of the most important, if not the most important things you can do with student, young students is instill in them the idea of lifelong learning. Because I don't care who you are, no one's going into a job and staying there for 35 years uh, without radical changes in that or the fact that they're gonna be going into a lot of different jobs uh, over time. So lifelong learning is, I think, a very, very important piece of the equation, which you can 
you know, work with young people. Uh, but boy, starting out with that, that 48 year old who, you know, finished high school at the age of 18. And that was 30 years ago was the last time they sat in the classroom. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's really one of the toughest pieces of in this whole equation. So I want to close by looking back at the investment and finance world. So since you started 50 years ago um, as a runner. Oh, don't make me sound so old. <laughs> <laughs> well, people, people can do the math themselves. I should have told, told, told you I was a runner in 1990. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and all the changes you've seen in the financial world and frankly have helped to affect some of them, you know, how does that make you look at the world of finance differently, either from the perspective of someone who's maybe entering the industry now or of, of an investor who's, who's trying, to, trying to find their way and, and find something that, that works for them? I mean, the field of investment is not immune from, from these uh, high sloping changes either. I think this has dramatic implications on the investment world. And I'm not sure that it's, as I said earlier, it's, I don't think it's really understood uh, to a, a meaningful uh, degree. I am being invited now to speak, um, actually I'm coming back in two weeks, three weeks, uh, to a security, an investment firm. You know, heard about what I was doing. They want me to come and speak to as many of their people who want to come uh, hear it. Uh, I was probably a couple of years ago, a major, major foundation uh, who I know, know one of the trustees well, all of a sudden, I get an email from the chief investment officer of the foundation. Uh, and we get on the phone. I was out of the country when we got back. I get on the phone with her. And she says, Art, I'd like you to come present to the investment committee of our foundation because the stuff that you're talking about can have broad implications for you know, the investment world. Um, so anyway, an example I always use is a uh, activist hedge fund guy who uh, I know well. And I was sitting and having lunch with him. This was about three years ago. And uh, we were talking, I laid all the, you know, a lot of this out to him. Six months later, I looked at his portfolio and there were two positions missing. And I said, Matt, what happened to you when we were together again? Why, why are those two positions gone? And he said, Art, because I had lunch with you. And basically it was two, um, it was the stock of two middle-class restaurant chains. Mm. And his logic was, you know, if the middle class is getting squeezed economically, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, one of the easy things you can do without is an extra meal, you know, out with the family or, you know, friends or whatever. You know, can't do without oxygen, but, you know, an extra meal at a restaurant chain you can do without. So I do think there are, you know, much broader implications out there. Now, I think at the same time, there's also some really interesting opportunities give you one area that I'm focused on from an investment standpoint mm -hmm. is the whole area, continuing the, in the whole area of uh, uh, education, uh, technology and training. You know, I'm searching for, you know, that augmented reality or virtual reality technology solutions to focus on training and education. Because going back to my comment about the 48 year old, you're not putting him back in a classroom. Right. Maybe through you know, these really interesting type technologies, uh, we might be able to do something. I remember the first time I put on uh, augmented reality goggles and I was taught how to install all of the uh, plumbing fixtures in a bathroom. So now I don't need a plumber anymore. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think we'll leave it with that. Art, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. It's really interesting thank you. story. Thank you for having me. This is great. Thanks for the opportunity.